conceptual perspectives people talk Real about talk, it, it throwing shots. all of the elements. <laughs> Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody has uh, kicked off uh, their New Year's on a good note. I uh, know at the time I'm recording this, most of you guys are still probably knocked out because you partied and enjoyed it. And hey, I'm not mad at you. Um, it's early Sunday morning and I'm sitting at my desk and I'm just sort of uh, determining the, the path and the direction I'm going to take in approaching the things that are passionate about me in the black community. I've been doing this now for 35 years and you get anchored in, you get hunkered in and you just want to keep fighting and pushing. And I'm determined to be a source of empowerment for my people and in knowledge, in resources, um, in inspiration and so much more. Uh, but if you're not careful, it takes its toll. And one of the things I promised myself as the end of 2022 uh, rapidly approached was that I wasn't going to pull any punches. Not that I do. I'm not one to coddle, but I'm very careful in how I handle my people because I know what my people have been through. And there are certain topics I've kind of pulled back from, even though I'm passionate about, I talk about, and I work in consistently. I'm not backing off of those in 2023 because we are right now in, in in decline and we don't even realize it. We're so caught up in symbolism. We're so caught up in what we drive. We're so caught up in the number of digits we think we have in our, in our paycheck that we think we've arrived. We're still in last place in every socioeconomic category, every political category, every social, social status. We lack power. They keep selling us on this buying power we have of $1.4 trillion. And they keep forgetting to tell us that the vast majority of it is debt by way of credit. We keep buying into it and we keep losing. But I want to talk about something that's at the core of our inability to stay and it's the disintegration of the black family nucleus but it is not by coincidence happenstance or uh, some arbitrary uh, influence there are some dynamics at play that have internally worked against us there are mechanisms and machinations on the outside uh, exogenous forces coming against us and it is wreaking havoc and I'll keep telling you the family is the core nucleus and the, the marriage is the foundation of the family. And when you spurn these things, you lose the ability to influence the life of, the, of your children, which means you can't influence the future. Not effectively because you have 
disrupted the natural order. The natural order is masculine, feminine energy sinking to create a synergistic force. And in that synergistic force, you are inculcating, racially socializing, preparing, empowering our youth to go out and do something. We are setting our values, interests, and principles. We're doing those things. The problem is there have been a bunch of interrupters and there are a lot of elephants in the room. One of the elephants in the room that nobody really wants to talk about is childhood sexual abuse. We don't want to talk about the damage that's done to our children before they ever turn 18. And to me, 18 isn't grown. Uh, it's a legal age of adulthood, which serves others more than it serves us. We still need to be preparing. Now, in the right environment, in the right situation, can you create a reality and an environment in which a child that is 18 is more mature? Yes. That environment that we reside, this resi environment we reside in does not allow us to do that. We are not, number one, properly socializing our young black males at an early enough age to develop the maturity you need to actually be able to walk out into this world at 18 and get it get it on and thrive in this world that's the truth of the uh, of the matter but when we talk about childhood sexual abuse there are a couple of things i want to talk about and i want to be very clear and i'm going to talk about them number one is silent condemnation silent condemnation has been one of the most disruptive and uh uh disruptive and uh destructive forces in the home it's where we know it's happening but because of the, the 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 backlash that will come with outing it or confronting it or turning these people into the authorities, we sit on it. And then what ultimately happens is the victim is ostracized and becomes the pariah in the family and everybody's constantly applying pressure on them to keep their mouth closed. And what we find if we look deeper is they aren't the first victim. And they are just being demanded to stand and fall in line. The silent condemnation has to stop. We're going to have to get away from it. There was a time where uh, black men were the sole providers. Black women stayed at home. And they, they'll tell you that time never happened. And actually, there were a large number of happened. What you got to understand is, as far as home ownership, we haven't changed at all since before uh, 1960. In 1960, the home ownership for blacks was 41%. So we haven't, since the civil rights movement, we haven't gained not one iota in that element or component of wealth building. And there are a lot of things that play into that. And I don't want to get too caught up in that. But what I want to do is, and I touch on the things I'm going to tell you now, I touch on in three particular books that I have written. Um, my first book, uh, the Invisible Father, Reversing the Curse of a Fatherless Generation. Uh, we're actually bringing that back to print. It, it has always remained uh, in digital form, uh, but we are now bringing it uh, back in print. So you'll be able to get it at all the usual places in print this month. But my first book, uh, The Invisible Father, Reversing the Curse of a Fatherless Generation, my 19th book, Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery, my 23rd book, The Undoing of the African American Mind, and I touch on it slightly in my 24th book, Academic Apartheid. But we talk about the influence of what happens inside of the home and how it impacts the life of the children in that home long after they become adults. We talk about adverse childhood experiences and the impact it has on their uh, health outcomes long after they become adults, long after they've left that uh, toxic, destructive environment, they're still reaping the repercussions of their experiences and they aren't getting the help they need to help mitigate those repercussions. That's on us. Uh, now, what I'm gonna get into in a moment is the impact on black men that nobody even believes exists. But we're going to talk about black women. Uh, this is where it became an issue with me. Is 20 years ago, I'm dealing with women who are coming to me for different things. And ultimately, I do this thing with my clients. When we can't readily identify what's causing their behavior, what's causing, whether it's depression, whether it's 
violence, whether it's becoming uh, reclusive, whether it's uh, practicing uh, behavior that is in some way detrimental or destructive, uh, if we can't readily identify the source, then we do what I call is I, uh, layer pilling. I'm literally going to slowly walk them back through their life month by month, year by year, peeling back layers slowly enough to develop trust and an understanding of what's happened and transpired in their lives. But I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get to that moment, that moment where it all started. And I can tell you when doing that, I came to a point to where it seemed almost every black woman that came to me for help. If I, if, if I, I went back enough and I'm not being suggestive in the way I do this, I'm never bringing it up. They are bringing it up and they are sharing it with me. And so I'm, I'm going like, how many women are out there? And so I contact, you've probably heard me say this before. I contact some other colleagues and I say, hey, look, let me know if you're dealing with this same phenomenon because I need to know if this is much more broader than I, uh, I'm seeing or, or is it just a situation where I just happen to be the person where every woman who's ever been sexually assaulted as a child is coming to, which I doubt. But I, I, I need to get some ideas. And the people that I contacted were saying they were seeing the same thing. The crazy thing is there wasn't a lot of research on it from a racial perspective to really break down and see it. So we had to demand it. We had to start doing it. One of the things we've done at the Odyssey Project is spearhead uh, research like that. Now it's out there in abundance. And this is what we know. Uh on the conservative side, over 40% of our women were in some way sexually abused, molested, raped, uh, fondled or whatever before their 18th birthday. On a more liberal level, meaning different a different study, we're talking 60%. Either way, we're talking anywhere from almost half to over half of our women having went through this. Now, these are ones that are reporting it. So then you have to say, how many are out there not reporting it? Now, here's something else that we have to look at and talk about. No one wants to talk about is that about one in six males are uh, molested as children. Now, because sexual molestation and, 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 and rape and all this stuff it's a taboo t topic, just like mental health in the black community. It's not something that's normally discussed. It's definitely taboo ab amongst men because it tends to make males question their sexuality, especially if they were molested by another male. So then here we come in this situation where we now are trying to determine just how pervasive this is in the black community. But what we can tell you is that Black children are twice as likely to be molested in the home than non-whites. And so the immediate jump to conclusion is that we have a higher proclivity towards this type of sick behavior. That's not the case. What happens is we have fewer men in the home. And what we find is that the risk of being sexually assaulted, whether you are a female or a male, is increased when the biological father is not in the home. Now, this brings about another elephant in the room. The casual nature in which we procreate. We have abandoned the principles of family. We have abandoned the principles of marriage. Um, it's every man for himself, every woman for himself. Uh, we do, we've gotten out of where we're trying to dismiss the idea of spiritual uh, and soul connectivity by way of intercourse and it's been 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 in, been observed and studied for years uh, and we don't see the fracturing of ourselves as we consistently move around from partner to partner and then we are procreating so we're bringing children into this brokenness this disruptive force and there's no continuity there's no connectivity there's no certainty there's no stability we are literally losing ourselves in an antinomianistic pursuit of self we want to do whatever we want to do we want to do it how we want to do it we don't want to be 
obligated to anything. We don't want to be held accountable to anything. We don't want to be uh, responsible. We want to be able to do what we want to do, how we want to do it. And we don't see the social long-term implications. And so what happens? We end up reaping the consequences of antisocial behavior. So what am I getting at? We can almost assume that black males uh, have experienced childhood sexual abuse based on the math, based on what we know, probably one in four. And it may be higher because we can't get black males to report it's taboo. Uh, it's not something they want to talk about. But what we can look at is what is being reported. We can also look at the, the data that says that blacks are more likely to experience it at twice the rate of whites. And we can kind of look at what's being reported there and say, OK, even in other races, the male is going to be less likely. And we can say that this is probably a lot more pervasive than we believe. That's going to influence you. That's a traumatic experience. And when we don't treat trauma, trauma manifests in all types of ways that are almost always antisocial. We can talk about black group economics till we're blue in the face. We can talk about black business ownership until we're blue in the face. We can talk about higher education until we're blue in the face. If we don't talk about healing, if we don't talk about having a, a, a healed whole person, that's capable of stepping out and taking on life with a clear ability to process what they're experiencing without them processing it through the filter of trauma, we're going to consistently have these problems. And then we are trying to cultivate relationships, but we don't have the proper modeling for true long-term relationships. We don't have uh, the level of understanding commitment and it's almost impossible to put two broken people or one broken person in a situation in which both people need to sink. This isn't this sinking isn't about always agreeing. This sinking isn't about always being on the same page. This sinking is about direction and destiny. The sinking is about what do we want to achieve? What are our what are our values, our interests, our principles? What do we want to live our lives? What's the standard? Do we want to be good people? Do we want to be business owners? Do we want to be financially responsible? Do we want to give back to the community? Do we want because all of these things that we say we want to be needs to also be passed down to our offspring, our progeny, our children, so that and, and taught in a way and inculcated into their psyche in a way that it becomes a part of who they are. They naturally aspire to be the type of people we are, but be better than we are. That's the responsibility. That's why we have to socialize it into them. We have to show it to, to them through uh uh, social learning theory. We have to show it to them through uh, observation. We have to show it to them through teaching and exercises. We need to have them go through a process of understanding who they are. One of the biggest problems that I see with 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 each subsequent generation is a lack of identity. We've lost ourselves in a world that doesn't recognize us and we seek to be recognized by trying to aspire to be what they are in their world and we don't fit and that leads to frustration. We're looking at a 30% spike in suicides in the black community over the last five years. In that same time period, uh, Suicides among young black males between the ages of 14 and 24 has gone up almost 50%. And in the ages of 5 to 13, our young black girls now in the number one slot. This isn't by accident. This isn't some social phenomenon. This is us failing to, number one, create an environment that our children can thrive in early 
create the resources for our children to be responsive to treatment when necessary, create the resources to reach our adults when we find out that they also need treatment and to be able to respond to the needs, but we are going to have to get back to it. Uh, let me tell you something. Saying it's too late isn't an option. It's fatalism. I have been able to accomplish some things that the average person will not accomplish. And what I can tell you is I never take on a mindset that I can't or it's too late. I missed it. I'm too old or that opportunity. It's I'm going to do it until I get it right. And if I don't get it right, I'll die trying. The, the, the moment that you sit up and say it's too late, you surrender to what you're facing and it takes control of your life and your destiny. And one of the problems that, that, that scares me is those of us who have found a way to cope and manage and on the outside we appear to have things together and we are successful in the eyes of most of our peers, uh, we tend to think that we, we tend to take that fatalistic approach. Well, it's too late, you know, because we think we've made it. We don't realize that there's still a connectivity that uh, in, in the ecosystem of race, our numbers matter. And in the ecosystem of race, there is this natural connectivity that no matter how wealthy you become, you're still black. And as long as this system has power players that are opposed to us and benefit from our oppression, we're going to always have to realize that while we think we look at some of the people who may have made it much better than the average person who thinks they're successful. The, you know, the Kanye's, the Kyrie's, all these people had had what, what you call super bad and step out of line and bam, step out of line, bam. And so, the idea that your success is safe because you're not in the hood doing what they're doing and showing up at stores dressed like they're dressed and acting like they're acting, you're better. I think we miss the whole thing. I think that should be a standard of behavior. I think that should be a code of conduct. I've written on that. I've, I've sat down and researched and put together the blueprint for black empowerment, including a code of conduct, including uh, economic principles and agendas, including the social agendas, including uh, educational agendas and so much more. This is a process, but it starts in the family. And how can we build in the family when the family isn't safe? We love to talk about how people are behaving, but we don't like to talk about why. We love to sit up and talk about young black boys and how violent they are, but we don't want to talk about the causality behind African-American adolescent and young adult male violence. I've put years and years of research. That's why I created Black Man Lead. Then Black Man Lead also became a means of socializing young black males into the responsibility of manhood in totality, meaning to build a family instead of just procreating to be able to support a family, financial responsibility and building wealth, ownership, because that is where you gain power. Uh, the same thing we're working with little, little, little girls and our young women. We have to create a sense of awareness of self because when you lose self, you lose your value, your worth, your identity, and you allow other people to assign an identity to you. And in assigning that identity, it's never meant to benefit you. It's always for the purpose of them being able to exploit your gifts, to exploit your skills, exploit your talents, and give you the very minimum in the process. It's our responsibility to sit up and say, this is who we are. But again, this comes in the family. It is so hard to do this. Now, this is something that really gets people upset, but the, 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 the studies uh, are what they are. And what, what is weird is we, uh, I think one of the things that has really, really devastated the black community is the black girl magic, strong black woman narrative that's pushed out of there. 
So, Doc, are you saying that our women are strong? And I say our women are exceptionally strong. What I'm saying is, why is there a need for her to be that strong? Why is there a need for her to be a single mother and carry on the responsibilities of two different roles, one of which she's not designed for? Why is it that she's constantly having to push against violence against herself and her, her, her offspring? Why is it that she's, she's, she's having to survive a centuries-long uh, struggles that she should be guarded and protected against. This isn't sitting up blaming the men. This is sitting up getting to a point. Here's what the studies show. Despite all of the efforts, despite the unyielding commitment of the average black woman, when I say the average black woman, I don't mean she's average in who she is. I mean the vast majority of black women because, see, they love to show you the ones that are doing everything that we don't want to be associated with. But the vast majority of our women aren't that. That's a part of our uh, population and they are a part of who we are. We have to feel and realize in our code of conduct, in the building out of our blueprint, how we're going to handle that because it's going to have an impact on how far we go. But when we talk about our women, they're out there driving you know, driving, striving, they're working their butts off, sometimes two and three jobs to make ends meet. And the idea is we celebrate that. But how effective is it? It's killing her. And we are coming to find out that on under the same pretty much socioeconomic standards, single parent children raised in single parent homes with fathers actually fare better than children raised in single parent homes with mothers. Are children in both homes? Actually, they found there were very little difference in children reared in two parent households versus single parent households with the father being the head of the household. There was a stiff decline in that of females. And there's a lot of different reasons why I'm not gonna get into that. What I'm trying to get across is this idea that being a strong black woman produces what we need to produce as a collective or even individually isn't true. Has, has it been necessary in many instances? Unfortunately, this isn't the pointing the blame. This isn't me attacking. This is me saying we got some things we need to really undress because it's in that same single parent household with the mom that the child is more likely to be sexually abused, sexually molested. It is more likely for the child to be less protected and to and for predators inside and outside of the family to feel safer in perpetrating violence and sexual deviance towards minors. The ramifications and repercussions aren't the same, at least in the mindset of the perpetrator. I know mothers are protected. I know some mothers out there will light you up about their babies. Most of them will. I'm not saying that that's not. I'm saying that there is a reality we cannot ignore. We have left our women to do something that they are not naturally designed to do. And what happens is the things that they are naturally designed to do, they can't function fully in that because they're splitting their energy in trying to master something that they weren't designed to do. And that's creating a problem. Our children are suffering from it. We are going to have to do a better job. One of the reasons why I'm constantly on people about supporting the work we do at the Odyssey Project is because we've got to start building somewhere. And here's the thing that I've said often uh, and I'll, continue, I'll continuously say it is in order for us to really, true, really and truly achieve power, liberation, freedom, is we're gonna have to have men and women, uh, and I start with men uh, because I am one, we're gonna have to have us, there are gonna have to be a number of us who are willing to plant seeds that we will not uh, live long enough to see come to fruition. We live in a world where because we lack power, we want symbols of power, we want to be acknowledged, we want to feel uh, like we've achieved something. So we look for band-aids to put on stab wounds. We look for quick fixes all the time because we want to be 
recognized as the person that fixed it. We want to be recognized as the person that came up with the solution. And the truth of the matter is you don't undo decades and centuries of damage and trauma and ill uh, development uh, in a one year, two year, three year, or even five year period, what you do is you start to purge generations. What does that mean? You've got to have a generation that's untouched by all the negative stuff that's influenced the previous generation and created the destructive things that we see, the lack of progression. We, we, we have to acknowledge we're seeing a widening in the web gap. So despite what images are being presented, we are not winning. We are getting worse. Also, we in, 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 in when you're planting these seeds, you're sitting up and saying, I'm, 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 I'm going to take the very thing I say is the future of my race, our children. I'm going to plant seeds in them, plant seeds of awareness of who they are, their identity. Plant seeds of confidence because they are built for something. They have the capacity to do exceptional and extraordinary thing. An awareness of their beauty, their strength, their intelligence. An, 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 a sense of responsibility to achieve. Uh, we're no longer going to accept C's as being successful. We're no longer going to accept average as the uh, constant state of achievement. We're going to demand something more of them, and we're going to give them what they need to reach that achievement. And what, what we have to do is we have to protect them. We can't expose them to the idea that they're inferior until they know they're not for sure, until they can go up against somebody and they say, they can be told they're dumb and they can know, no, I know, I know who I am. They, they need to know they're beautiful so that when they keep getting presented with images of, of, of Euro, the Eurocentric idea of what's beautiful, they're not shaken into trying to transform. They need to know their inner selves. They need to know their spiritual power. They need to know their, uh, the force of their imagination to create things that do not exist. They need to understand that they were built to excel in this world, but we have to do that at an early age and that's best done in the home. But since, and it's, but where we are now is we got to start with what we have. That's why I created Black Men Lead. That's why we have the other programs that deal with young girls and young women is because we are preparing them as they are. And it, and, and what happens is again, a lot of the seeds I'm planting I may not live long enough to see come to fruition. That may be 30 years down the line. I hope I'm still here. Uh, and if I am, I'm going to be, you know, in my golden years and it'll be good to see. But, you know, if I'm not here, I'm planting the seed because I've got children following me and their children and their children and their great grandchildren that are going to need to be able to have something to stand on that I created. Now, I may not get a chance to stand on it. I may have to continue my fight the way I am, but I can't consistently keep passing the same hurt, the same pain, the same failures, the same frustrations down to the next generation. And if I'm not going to do that, then I have to be willing to admit we're going to have to be a homes. We're going to have to get back to marriage. We're going to have to get back to the respect of our women. We're going to have to get back to the respect and, and honoring of our men. We're going to have to get back to understanding what literally drives people to want to respect us so that we can start carrying ourselves like that. And that is going to take a lot of work because we have literally been programmed to underperform. We've been programmed to blame. We've been programmed to accept. And now we're sitting up saying that won't get it. The elephant in the room is you can't have 40 to 60 percent of your females being sexually abused and expect to produce a Productive generation. Same thing. You can have one in four of your male black uh, of your black males being sexually abused and and mistreated, and that's just the sexual abuse. What about the domestic abuse? What about uh, emotional abuse? What about neglect? All these other things that are a part of adverse childhood experiences that lead to all of these negative outcomes in adulthood. I've written on that in Epigenetics and Psychology. I've written on that in Born, at, Born, Born in Captivity, Psychopathologies, and Legacy of Slavery. I've written on it in The Undoing of the African American Mind. Look, we have a lot of work to do. And sitting up saying it's too much, it's going to be hard, it's tough. Yeah, it is. It's hard, it's tough, and it's going to take some time. But the alternative is to sit up and take a fatalist approach and say it's too late. Those who make it, make it. That is a cop-out. There are going to be those who don't. 
But we, we, we don't choose by looking at where they're at and saying they can't make it. We put our heart into it and we give everything we have. Those who get on, get on. Those who don't, don't. But we don't choose who don't come. Now, I, now, obviously, if they become devastating force in our community, if they're killing in our community, if they're raping in our community, if they're maligning and robbing our community, then they're the enemy. They are not the community. Their race does not qualify them for immunity. They should be dealt with expeditiously and intensively. And, 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 and there, there's no exception to that. You do not harm our women, you do not harm our elderly, and you do not harm our children. And there should be absolutely no exceptions to this, point blank and period. There has to be some sense of protection and a responsibility for us to sit up and create an environment where we can heal. You know, we talk about we like we understand trauma, and I've and I've I've written intensively to explain how trauma is passed down. This isn't some idea illusion. This isn't some uh, suggestive curse. This is literally genetically predisposed, genetically passed down, genetically experienced, and recorded in our genes. It's influencing everything from cancer, lupus. Um, uh, other autoimmune diseases, uh, type 2 diabetes, all this stuff is literally epigenetically responsive to the trauma we're passing down. And we don't get it. I've written on it. I don't have time to get into it in depth, but it's out there if you want to research it, if you want to get any one of those books, Born in Captivity, um, um, The Undoing of the African American Mind are great places to start because it's going to break down all of the things that we've had to deal with, what it has done to us socially, what it's done to us emotionally, what it's done to us mentally, what it's done to us spiritually, how it's playing out in our world, in, 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 in performance, in relationships, and so much more. We're going to have to answer the question of why uh, the second leading cause of death for black females between 15 and 44 is intimate partner violence. Now, it's not a racially exclusive phenomenon, but that can't be us. We can't be killing our women. We need to ask why marriage is still on the decline while procreation is, is on the rise. We need to have an understanding of what's driving this because we need to address it. We have to be at our best to win. You can't possibly think split homes is our best. You can't possibly think that marriage, marriage is a hack. Marriage is a wealth hack. Marriage is a stability hack. And you've, you've got people that understand that beyond emotion. We move so much on our emotion. We move so much on how we feel that we abandon the very thing that can sustain us and get us to a point. I'm not saying stay in abusive marriages. I'm not staying in, in marriage where no one, where, where the person isn't treating you with respect and with kindness and with love. I'm sitting up saying that this idea that everything is going to be ooh all the rest of your life, that everybody's going to be on the same page every day, that they're not going to be challenging moments. Get that out of your head. What you need to focus on, do I have somebody that'll go to the mat for me? Do I have somebody who speaks life and power into me? Do I have somebody who says, what do you need? Let me let me make sure I can get it for you. Do I have somebody that says, you're not alone? Then if that's the case, then you need to build. You need to grow because there is a hack. It's so much easier to do this thing together than it isn't. There's a sinking of an energy that brings together. And it's not, it, I'm not talking solely from a religious perspective. I'm not talking, uh, I'm talking historically. You can study it, and marriage is one of the most powerful hacks for projecting your values, interests, and principles into future generations. With that being said, look, I'm going to get ready to get off of here. Uh, as you saw in the beginning in the intro, we are still doing a fundraiser. We did not even get close to our end of the year fundraiser. I'm still pushing it. We need to raise money. I'm asking everybody who believes in the work we're doing, who's seen all of the content that I've done, all of the programs I've created, all the work I continuously do. Some of you have actually sent people to me. Some of, the, some of you are people who have actually contacted me yourselves. I've done advocating for people who were falsely accused and arrested, falsely mishandled by law enforcement, falsely handled or uh, mishandled in the school system uh, from on every level. 
I've, I've been there and I will continue to go to where I will continue to advocate. We need support. Go to the description box. You can either click the link and give, uh, you can do a direct link. As soon as you click it, you go right there and give, or you can click and you can go and you can register as a supporter. Uh, all those links are in there. Or you can give by way of the organization's cash app account. That information is in there as well. But we need your support. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable New Year's Day or whenever you watch this. Have a great day.